Good day, and thank you for joining me. I am Norton the First, by grace of God, Emperor of the United States, and Protector of Mexico. And I'm here to tell you my story and how I became the Emperor. So let us begin. San Francisco is a mad city inhabited for the most part by perfectly insane people, but whose women are of a remarkable beauty. That was said by Rudyard Kipling. It's an odd thing, but anyone who disappears is said to be seen in San Francisco. That was said by Oscar Wilde. Everyone understands Mickey Mouse. Few understand Herman Hesse. Hardly anyone understands Albert Einstein. And no one understands Emperor Norton, said by Malkalypse the Younger. San Francisco has been known throughout its history as a haven for colorful characters, perhaps none more colorful and well-remembered as me. I was born Joshua Abraham Norton in Deptford, just outside of London, England, on February 4th, 1818. And when I was two years old, my family emigrated to Algoa Bay, Cape of Good Hope, South Africa. After my father's death, I left South Africa in 1849 with $40,000, possibly left to me by his estate or possibly that I'd earned on my own. I don't remember. And like so many others that year, I sailed to San Francisco to seek my fortune, arriving on Commercial Street's Long Wharf aboard the ship, the Franzica. But I would not make my fortune by panning for gold. Instead, I founded Joshua Norton and Company in an adobe cottage at Jackson and Montgomery Streets, where the building known as Sherman's Bank stands today. I acquired entire shiploads of commodities. I built a cigar factory, a small wood-framed office, a rice mill, and purchased investment properties. In just a few short years, I increased my fortune to $250,000, which is $10 million in today's currency. But my fortune, great as it was, was not enough. I wanted more money. Now, a rice famine struck China in 1850, causing rice prices to triple in the U.S. And believing that I was cornering the market on rice, I purchased what I believed to be the only boatload of commodity in San Francisco Harbor at a premium, thinking that I would increase my fortune many times fold when the price peaked. Unknown to me were the two shiploads of Peruvian rice arriving over the next several days. The price of rice plummeted to far less than what it was than before the famine. My rice was nearly worthless. A legal battle ensued, leaving me bankrupt. By 1857, I was a shamed, broken, and largely forgotten man. I disappeared for a couple of years, and no one knows exactly what happened to me during that time. But then, on the 17th of September, 1859, I walked into the offices of the San Francisco Daily Evening Bulletin newspaper and handed editor George Fitch this proclamation requesting its publication. At the peremptory request and desire of a large majority of the citizens of these United States, I, Joshua Norton, formerly of Algoa Bay, Cape of Good Hope, and now for the last nine years and ten months past of San Francisco, California, declare and proclaim myself Emperor of these United States. And in virtue of the authority thereby in me vested, do hereby order and direct the representatives of the different states of the Union to assemble in musical hall of this city on the first day of February next, then and there to make such alterations in the existing laws of the Union as may ameliorate the evils under which this country is laboring, and thereby cause confidence to exist both at home and abroad in our stability and integrity. That evening, a headline in the bulletin read, Have We an Emperor Among Us? The bulletin printed the proclamation the 17th day of September, 1859, and I would become... Norton the First, Emperor of the United States. Later, I would add the title Protector of Mexico. 
if I were to do that in any other country in the world, any state in the U.S., I would be locked up as a madman. Except San Francisco, of course. Indeed, the people of San Francisco treated me as if I really were the emperor for the next 21 years. I ate for free in restaurants. The police would salute me. I rode transit for free. I even printed my own imperial treasury bonds, which were accepted as legal tender throughout the city whenever I presented them. Now, an emperor had to be suitably clothed, and uniforms were given to me by army officers at the Presidio. I would be seen walking the streets in this Union officer's frock coat enhanced with epaulets, topped with a tall beaver hat adorned with plumes, a cavalry sword on my hip, an umbrella, and an ornately handled walking stick. A haberdasher gave me a hat and then took out an advertisement in the paper declaring his store gentlemen's outfitters to his imperial majesty. A tavern posted a window sign that said, fine wines and spiritous liquors by appointment to his majesty Norton I. Indeed, merchants would bribe reporters to have their stories associated with me in the press. Now, as I said, I ate for free in restaurants, especially the taverns of Montgomery Street. Often reporters would buy me a drink to interview me or get one of my imperial proclamations. Now, those lunch buffets where you'd have to buy a drink to get the food turned into some things we still have with us to this day, like Hofbrau restaurants and the concept of happy hour. I was determined to make great changes and issued numerous proclamations calling for Congress, the Supreme Court, the presidency, and the Democratic and Republican parties to be dissolved. Maybe not such a bad idea after all, eh? I also issued proclamations that all this, although dismissed at the time, were testaments to my imperial vision. I called for the spanning of San Francisco Bay by either a bridge or tunnel. The following is decreed and ordered to be carried into execution as soon as possible that a suspension bridge be built from Oakland Point to Goat Island, and thence to Telegraph Hill provided that such bridge can be built without injury the navigable waters of the Bay of San Francisco. I called for the establishment of a League of Nations to promote world peace. I called for the erection of a Christmas tree every year in Union Square. And today we have the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge, which should be called the Emperor Norton Bridge, the BART Transbay Tube, the United Nations, and the annual Union Square Christmas Tree, all testaments to my imperial vision. I also issued a proclamation that unfortunately goes unenforced. Whoever, after due and proper warning, shall be heard to utter the abominable word Frisco, which has no linguistic or other warrant, shall be deemed guilty of a high misdemeanor and pay the imperial treasury as penalty the sum of $25. You've all been sufficiently warned on this matter. In 1863, I took up a residence at the Eureka Lodgings, located at 624 Commercial Street between Montgomery and Kearney, where I lived for the next 17 years, always paying my rent of 50 cents a day in cash. It was there that I was recorded in the 1870 census with my occupation listed as emperor. And in the column that explained why I was not eligible to vote, the census took taker chose the option of insane. But was I crazy? Or was I crazy like a fox? Now, I claimed that I had been born into the Bourbon family of France. The Bourbons had given me as an infant to my father and mother in an effort to protect me from assassins and mobs. In conversation, I would frequently discuss the physical similarities between myself and Francis Charles X, keeping a miniature portrait of him on hand to illustrate my claim. After my death, the call newspaper suggested that I might have been an illegitimate son of Napoleon III of France. The same lofty forehead, aquiline nose, and short 
imperial beard. During my lifetime, I only met one other peer, another sovereign, and that was Emperor Pedro II of Brazil when he came on a visit to San Francisco. I was introduced to him as the Emperor of the United States and Protector of Mexico, and we had a lovely, lovely conversation. Now, I believed that as emperor, I had certain responsibilities. I visited schools and went to church every Sunday, Old St. Mary's one week, the First Unitarian Church another, and on Saturday, I went to Temple Emmanuel when it was located on Sutter Street. Because I felt it was my duty to encourage religion and morality by showing myself at church and to avoid jealousy, I attended them all in turn. Although a Jew by birth, I was admonished by my father for mocking his prayers. I was not given a Jewish burial at either of my funerals, although some say the Jewish Kaddish prayer for me on the anniversary of my death, my yard site. Now, while in San Francisco, I would meet up with a childhood friend from Algoa Bay, Nathan Pizer. He did not seem to recollect me, recollect at first, until I called to mind meeting him at my father's house. And all once I said, why, yes, Nathan, I distinctly remember you and the correction I received for raising a disturbance at a Jewish prayer meeting. I took him to my room. We had a long conversation about my mother, my father, and my sisters. He asked me how I came by the title of emperor and why I wore the uniform that I then had on. I went to the door and turned the key and whispered that before I would tell him, I would impose a silence upon his lips uh, that I was not Miss, the son of Mr. Norton of Cape Town, that I was sent there to save myself from being assassinated, that I was adopted by the Nortons and had retained their name for love of them and had taken the title Emperor, which I was rightly entitled to bear, and the uniform that I wore was presented to me by Queen Victoria and all the people here and in Mexico were my subjects. Mr. Pizer looked at me for a moment. He told me he thought it was crazy, to which I replied, and so do a many good others. My days followed a regular pattern. Every morning, I dressed in my uniform, paid my rent, and read the newspapers. Then I walked a block and a half to Portsmouth Square where I would sit on park benches with the old 49ers. I was a people's emperor and was known to be perfectly rational, approachable, and could speak eloquently on a number of subjects except one. If you questioned my authority as emperor, I would become quite agitated. When the old St. Mary's church bell signaled noon, I would have lunch at one of the numerous saloons on Montgomery Street, and after lunch, would go to the Mechanics Institute Library to play chess or write a proclamation. That's where many of them are written. Now, it was in the saloons of Montgomery Street where one of the most enduring myths about my life took root. San Francisco had adopted two beloved mascots, the dogs, Bummer and Lazarus. They had a notable talent for kept killing rats in a city that was teeming with them and were rewarded for their accomplishments with food given by grateful tavern owners. Edward Jump was an aspiring young artist who made his living drawing cartoons, and his cartoon, The Three Bummers, depicted me and the two dogs enjoying a free meal at a buffet table. It appeared in a few newspapers and in the window of a tavern. When I saw this depiction, I became enraged and attempted to break the window with my walking stick only succeeding in breaking the walking stick. An excellent book on the subject, Bummer and Lazarus, San Francisco's Famous Dogs by Malcolm Barker, yes, Barker wrote a book about the dogs, makes an excellent case. Mr. Barker's research concludes, quote, of all the contemporary newspaper accounts of Bummer and Lazarus, not one mentioned Norton. In 20 years of newspaper accounts about Norton, not one mentioned the dogs. There is much controversy about the dogs, but I will leave you with this. As I said, they were noted in San Francisco for their talents in catching rats. And in that period, there were a lot of wild dogs running around San Francisco, biting people, and the Board of Supervisors had to take action. 
they passed a special law that said that any dogs that were unmuzzled or unclaimed had to be destroyed. Included were Bummer and Lazarus. The Mercers of Montgomery Street wouldn't have that. They didn't want to lose their beloved ratters. The people of San Francisco didn't want to lose their mascots. So the Board of Supervisors was lobbied successfully to pass a second law that specifically exempted Bummer and Lazarus from the first law, thereby making them the wards of the people and sparing their lives. Here's what's interesting. Bummer and Lazarus were at that meeting at that very moment, and no one knows how they knew how to get there. Uh, Lazarus would die first, Bummer later, and they were taxidermied, and they were placed on display at a bar located at 425 Sansom Street. It was assumed by Barker and many others that they had burned up in the Great Earthquake and Fire of 1906. However, in the second edition of his book, he discovers the newspaper clippings that show they were given to the Golden Gate Park Museum, now the DeYoung, in February of 1906, just a couple of months before the Great Earthquake and Fire would have destroyed them. The last entry about them is another newspaper article from 1910 that says they were being sent out to be re-taxidermied and they would be placed in the natural history section of the museum. That's where the trail went cold for many years. But a couple of years ago, I was able to successfully contact the DeYoung. They went through their ledgers for 1910 only to discover that Bummer and Lazarus had been destroyed by the taxidermist because they were filled with bugs and could not be saved. I was rather hoping to find them somewhere, but we don't write history. History writes itself. In 1867, an overzealous police officer, Armand Barbier, created a civic uproar I was at the Palace Hotel, and I was just minding my business, reading the newspaper, when the manager called over Barbier to have me arrested for vagrancy. When I produced my boarding room key and some money in my pocket, he certainly could not take me in for that. So instead, he trumped up a charge of involuntary treatment of a mental disorder. Newspapers got a hold of that story and had a field day. The next morning, a highly embarrassed police chief, Patrick Crowley, immediately released me with his apology. And from that day forward, all police officers were ordered to salute me when I would pass them. They rarely do today, but the fire department always does. I attended the California State Legislature and my input was always warmly received. I would travel by train or boat. One time, my imperial currency was refused by the conductor. I raised a fuss and I was given, later, a lifetime pass. One of my proudest achievements as emperor occurred in Chinatown, but some will say occurred south of market. We don't really have this question fully settled, but it involves our Chinese community. I was a, a defender of equality. And either I saw a group of hooligans about to descend upon a de group of defenseless Chinese intent upon pummeling them or worse, or I saw a rally by the bigot Dennis Kearney. And by the way, Kearney Street is not named after him. It's another Kearney. And I either put myself between the two groups, the Chinese and the hooligans, or interrupted Kearney's meeting saying, we are all God's children, after reciting the Lord's Prayer. I was known to speak up for equality for African Americans, fair treatment for Native Americans, and I was an early advocate of the vote for women. I am often asked, if I ever married, and sadly the answer is no. Now for a time, I did court a Miss Minnie Wakeman. Once writing, my dear Miss Wakeman, in arranging for my empress, I shall be delighted if you will permit me to make use of your name. Should you be willing, please let me know, but keep your own secret. It is safer that way, I think. Your devoted friend, the emperor. Oh, there was little doubt that Miss Minnie would keep my proposal a secret. Her mother would see to that. 
Mary Wakeman, her mother, was still in mourning black for the husband she'd lost in January and was in no mood to see the family's name held up to ridicule by insensitive reporters. She knew the newspapers would not allow a widow's grief to stand in the way of a good story. Minnie was then busy editing her father's memoirs for publication, found the time to write a short letter thanking me for graciously thinking her worthy of my attentions, but advising me that she was already betrothed. This happened to be true. There was a handsome young man named William Bostwick Curtis, whom she was engaged to wed. Upon learning this, I would write to Minnie, Dear, my dear Miss Winnie, I did not receive your note until this morning. Having been absent nearly a fortnight attending the legislature, otherwise would not have been so rude as to have called upon you yesterday. Regret extremely your previous engagement. Hope if anything should occur to break it off, you will think of the one who loves you to distraction. Oh, Mitty kept her secret well. In fact, it never would have come to light at all if my love letters had not found their way into the Bancroft Library's archives at the University of California in Berkeley, when Miss Wakeman Curtis died in 1933. I might not have impressed her as a suitor, but apparently she treasured my letters. I did, however, have a widow. Jose Saria was his name. He was an entertainer in the 1950s and 60s at a bar and cafe called the Black Cat, which was located on Kearney Street between Washington and Jackson Streets. There's a plaque there commemorating that in the sidewalk. Started off as a waiter, but one night the musical act did not show up and was pressed into service, singing operatic arias, was an instant success and was asked back many, many times, became a regular at the Black Cat. Jose was the first openly LGBT person to run for public office, ran for the San Francisco Board of Supervisors in 1962. Was raising money for people to get, to get their bail at the city jail, which was not far by, nearby rather, was nearby because it was legal in those days to arrest LGBTQ people. And would sometimes lead a procession to sing of the jail windows, God bless us, Nellie Queens. While having those fundraisers would eventually evolve into establishing a group known as the International Imperial Court here in San Francisco over 50 years ago. Every year they elect an emperor and empress for this particular city. Now, the Imperial Court would, would sometimes, would, I'm sorry, would eventually grow all throughout the Americas, North, South, and Central America. There are many, many chapters, and they elect every year an emperor or empress for that city who reigns over that city for the one year. Jose was the first and named himself uh, the Widow Norton Empress. Now, Jose went on to buy a plot of land directly in front of my grave at the Woodlawn Cemetery in Colma with a matching tombstone with her imperial, or his, depending upon how you're looking at it, imperial title. And every year would lead a procession to my grave to pay homage to me, her husband. Jose passed away in 2013, and there was a tremendous funeral. Grace Cathedral on Knob Hill was filled to capacity, over 2,000 people attended, followed by burial at Woodlawn. I was not able to make that, but it was quite impressive. Seven buses, numerous limousines. I got there just in time. So indeed, I stood at my grave and watched them bury my widow. Wrap your heads around that for a moment, please. On May 10th, 1869, the Transcontinental Railroad was completed, connecting America from the Atlantic to Pacific, reducing a six-month journey by wagon to just, or ship, to just a few days. For the first time, San Francisco became a tourist destination, but journalists were unimpressed with the zoo at Woodward's Gardens and the Cliff House. They preferred to write about me. Items could be found in newspapers throughout the country. Many tourists knew about me from travel books. And when visitors asked what San Francisco had to offer, residents would urge them to come see me. Now, by now, nearly every store had a sign reading by appointment to Norton I. They sold picture postcards, dolls, even cigars with my likeness on the band. Colored lithographs 
were suitable for framing were especially popular, and unfortunately Edward Jump's The Three Bummers was one of the top sellers. Now, although I did not personally profit from the products bearing my likeness, I saw this as an opportunity to finance my empire. When the first Central Pacific train arrived in Oakland in 1869, I was there to greet the passengers with Imperial Treasury Bond certificates due and payable in 1880 at 7% interest. Remember that year. But the real value was in the signature, a treasured souvenir of a visit to San Francisco. The uniform given to me by the officers of the Presidio became threadbare, causing me to proclaim, whereas avaricious persons and others are conspiring against our person, and the digni and dignity by refusing to supply us with suitable clothing, although repeatedly requested to do so, and whereas the national dignity and rights are thereby injured. Therefore, now, we command that you proceed on receipt to this of our decree forthwith the tailors Walter and Tompkins on Montgomery Street of the city, and then and there proceed to take the rivets out of their shears and prohibit any person from repairing them and, or furnish them with new ones until they furnish us with our clothing, which they have long ago been requested to do, given by our hand on this 11th day of September, 1862, Norton the First. The San Francisco Board of Supervisors would eventually vote for a yearly stipend for the city's budget to see I was suitably tired. Some say the item is still in the budget, but uh, I have never been able to find it. I've gone through a number of years, line by line. We do know that there was a bill introduced into a committee in the California State Legislature to give me a yearly stipend, but that unfortunately was tabled. Mark Twain knew me well. At one point, his office building, well, was, his office was in a building in the Eureka, Eureka Lodgings. He even made me a character in Huckleberry Finn, the king. Not a flattering portrait. In fact, we're gonna have words with Mr. Clemens when we see him next. But after my death, he would write, oh dear. It was always a painful thing for me to see the emperor begging. For although nobody else believed he was an emperor, he believed it. What an odd thing it is that neither Frank Soule, nor Charlie Warren Stoddard, nor I, nor Bret Hart, nor any other professionally literary person of San Francisco has ever written up the emperor. Indeed, there are no interviews with me in archives. However, Robert Lewis's, Lewis Stevenson's daughter, Isabel Field, added to my legend with a book of her own. He was a gentle and kindly man, she remembers, in this life I've loved, and fortunately found himself in the friendliest and most sentimental city in the world, the idea being, let him be emperor if he wants to. San Francisco played the game with him. I am a character in numerous works of fiction and nonfiction, including Emperor Norton's, Go Emperor Norton's Ghost, A Rush of Dreamers, the graphic novel series The Sandman, Christopher Moore's Bloodsucking Fiends, all sorts of different fictional books. There are also a number of biographies on me. Uh, the one simply titled Norton the First is excellent, but uh, do contact me if you would like to learn more about the good books Emperor Norton Tour at gmail.com. The evening of January 8, 1880, was a cold and drizzly night in San Francisco. I was walking up California Street toward Knob Hill, having exited my lodgings, to attend a regular monthly meeting of the Hastings Society at California and DuPont Streets, as they were known by then. Of course, now DuPont is known as Grant Avenue. As I neared Old St. Mary's, across the street from it, I staggered a bit, then slumped to the sidewalk and took my final breath, ending my 21-year reign as Norton I, Emperor of the United States and Protector of Mexico. The next morning, all of San Francisco would wake to the news. The headline in the Chronicle would read, Le roi est mort. The king is dead. 
my obituary there ran. On the reeking pavement, in the darkness of a moonless night, under the dripping rain, and surrounded by a hastily gathered crowd of wandering strangers, Norton I, by grace of God, Emperor of the United States, and protector of Mexico, departed this life. Other sovereigns have died with no more of kindly care. Other sovereigns have died as they have lived with all the pomp of earthly majesty, but death having touched them, Norton I rises up as the exact peer of the haughtiest king or kaiser that ever wore a crown. Perhaps he will rise more than the peer of most of them. He had a better claim to kindly consideration than that his lot forbade to wade through slaughter to a throne and shut the gates of mercy on mankind. Though his harmless proclamations can always be traced to an innate gentleness of heart, a desire to, of, to effect uses and a courtesy, the possession of which would materially improve the bitterful living princes whose names will naturally suggest themselves. My landlord and some reporters entered my room at the Eureka Lodgings. They didn't find much, an 1882 French franc coin bearing the likeness of Charles X, the last of the Bourbon kings. Here it is. Some newspaper clippings, telegrams, photographs, tattered uniforms and hats, some walking sticks, not much more. My few meager possessions, some were taken by my landlord, but eventually the San Francisco Board of Supervisors would vote to hand them over to the California Pioneer Society, an institution that still exists. But unfortunately, those were all destroyed in the Great Earthquake and Fire of 1906. What survives are a couple of walking sticks, one belonging to the Young Museum, another to the California Historical Society. And they also have some of my um, currency. The Bancroft Library has currency as well as some of my proclamations. And of course, the Minnie Wakeman letters, but everything else was destroyed. I was headed to a pauper's grave. In the gold rush days, Joseph Eastland and I were charter members of the Occidental Lodge Number 22 of the Freemasons. Eastland was now president of the elite Pacific Club and an executive in the gas company that would one day be known as PG&E and a Pacific Club would be known as the Pacific Union Club. It is said that my dues throughout my reign were paid by Eastland, Sir William Booker, and other Freemasons. Eastland could not envision me buried in a pauper's grave. He raised the money necessary from his fellow club members, fellow Freemasons, for a funeral fit for an emperor at the Masonic Cemetery. Dressed in a black robe with a white shirt and black tie, I was placed in a rosewood casket. 30,000 people would come to view me and pay their last respects. My funeral cortege, cortege pardon me, was two miles long and it said some, and it's anywhere from 30,000 to 200,000 people lined the route to the cemetery in the inner Richmond district. As my coffin was lowered into the ground, there was a total eclipse of the sun. True. Perhaps Robert Louis Stevenson captured my essence the best. In his 1892 novel, The Wrecker, he wrote, of all our visitors, I, pre I prefer Emperor Norton. In what other city would a harmless madman who supposed himself emperor of the two Americas have been so fostered and encouraged? Where else? Would even the people of the streets have respected the poor man's illusions? Where else would bankers and merchants have received his visits, cashed his checks, and submitted to small assessments? By 1934, San Francisco removed all its cemeteries to make more space for the living. I was reinterred with full civic and military honors, including a 21-gun salute at Woodlawn Cemetery in Colma. There were numerous dignitaries in attendance there's also a plaque for me at the Jewish Cemetery, Home of Peace, in Colma, placed there by Grand Duchess of the Realm, Judy Left, to remember me in a Jewish way, because I was never given a Jewish burial. Uh, the Court of Historical Review did meet in 1979, and decreed that I should have one, and some rabbis did gather at my grave in 1980, the centennial of my death, to do that very, very thing. 
Now there is an or there is an organization, another one that comes to my grave every year, in addition to the Imperial Court, and that would be the Ancient and Honorable Order of E. Clampus Vitus, better known as the Clampers. Uh, they are either a historical drinking society or a drinking historical society. No one's ever been able to determine which. They came to California during the gold rush and were adopted by the 49ers because other organizations at that time, like the Masons, the Elks, the Moose, etc., the Odd Fellows, looked down upon the gold miners, would not let them join their organization. So they decided to start their own that poked fun of all the pomp and circumstance of the more established organizations. They still exist to this day, and they do serve some purposes in our modern times. They care for widows and orphans, especially the widows. They put up plaques to obscure history, usually involving liquor, and they revere me. So every year in January, close to the date of my death, they assemble at my grave. They have a ceremony there, and then they proceed to Malloy's Tavern in Coleman to knock back a few. Well, quite a few, actually. Why do I know this? Because I myself am a clamper. So if any of you are out there, what say the brethren? Hopefully there are some responses. <clears throat> I'm just looking here. So that ends my story. Or does it? You see, my spirit still lives on in San Francisco with eccentrics like Frank Chu, perhaps you've seen him, walking around with a sign that talks about 12 galaxies. If you want to get an earful, ask him what it means. He's quite harmless and is very, very nice, very friendly. And there are other eccentrics in this town and have been throughout our history, like Oofty Goofty, the Wild Man of Borneo, George Washington II, the Automatic Human Jukebox, the Space Lady, just to name a few. And we are very, very honored that the city of San Francisco and the people here have welcomed us back. That has been quite, quite gratifying. Now, if you were to go to the Eureka Lodgings today, that location on Commercial Street, the number is now 642. You will find a plaque in the ground toward the back of the park placed there by the clampers to show that that is where I live. And there are hopes that in 2023, when I assume the mantle of Noble Grand Humbug, that basically means the leader of the chapter or lodge, my first plaque will be one on the spot where I died. So keep your eyes open for that one. One last thing that was done to remember me, uh, you may remember if you were a fan of the Ghirardelli Chocolate Company, and you went there perhaps in the 1960s and 70s, maybe up through the 80s, you might have remembered an Emperor Norton Sunday. It's a goblet glass lined with sliced bananas and cherries, two scoops of vanilla ice cream, whipped cream, a sprinkling of nuts on top when I left out the hot fudge. Can't do that. Well, they took it off their menu and I have been spearheading an effort to bring it back, writing to them, contacting them, having protests to no avail. Now, we were able in 2019 to find a friendly uh, ice cream parlor of Ghirardelli's at, at Ghirardelli Square, and they made our group of 20 Emperor Norton Sundays. But I will not rest and shall not give up until they bring back our Sunday. That's an imperial decree, folks. So I would like to thank you for joining me today, and on behalf of a grateful empire, we wish you a happy and healthy year and good day.